All right, Michael McKnight, welcome to the Single Track Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A lot of topics I want to cover today. The first, I was taking a look at your LinkedIn, which I know is probably a weird thing to look at in the running world. We're typically talking about Instagram and Strava and whatnot, but you have some interesting experience on the business side of our sport. Like you worked at Ultra for a number of years. You've now been involved with Solomon for a couple of years. I want to start with that. Like you seem like you were kind of climbing the corporate ladder at Ultra. You were an event manager, you were a customer service rep, you were an athlete manager. So can you talk about how you got involved with Ultra first? Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't know that Ultra Footwear took or first originated in northern Utah. And I live in a small area called Cache Valley. It's about um, an hour and a half north of Salt Lake City. <clears throat> and I was, I didn't even know Ultra was here either, if I'm being honest. Um, <clears throat> but there's a bunch of us here locally that do trails together and like we, we run together and train together. And one of my buddies said that it was one day in the winter, we were doing a winter trail run, and he told me that the co-founder of Ultra Footwear was going to come running with us, uh, and that's Brian Beckstead. I don't know if you've heard of him before or not, but <clears throat> he's a really cool guy. We went running together. Um, I was in college at the time. I think I had about a year left before I got my bachelor's degree. And he told me a customer service job was opening up at Ultra if I needed to get like kind of a side job to help pay for college. And so I took that position. It was the, it was about April of 2016. Um, and then I graduated from Utah State University about two months later. And just when I was graduating, uh, I graduated in social work, by the way, so it's completely different than what I ended up doing with Ultra. But just when I graduated, he told me that there was um, an event manager position opening up. No, well, actually what happened was he said he was creating an athlete manager position and he wanted me to do it. And so I decided yes, um, because that sounded pretty sweet, obviously, to be able to work in this kind of field. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then um, <clears throat> about three or four days before I took that position, he told me that he had to let go of the event manager and he just wanted to combine the two positions. And so I ended up taking both of them on kind of a thing. And I think, I think the main reason he ended up combining it is because the previous event manager, um, he was trying to find somebody to go work Western States that year because Ultra was a partner and no one wanted to. <laughs> And being somebody that was new, getting into the sport, I, I was like doing customer service and they would have their meetings right behind us. And so I overheard this mm. conversation. And so I went to Brian after and I was like, if you can't find anybody to do it, I would love to go to Western States and rep Ultra. And so he, he sent me there. It was a good experience. So I think just being able to show my willingness to go to events kind of helped land that combination of the two. <laughs> Man, that's super cool. Well, just one more thing on the event manager position. Obviously, what's cool about you is you have this 360 view of the sport because not only are you an athlete, you're a coach, and you've been on the business side of things too. What have been or what were some of the biggest takeaways? Like what really opened your eyes on the event side of our sport that you have uh, taken with you into other areas of your life? Like, do you ever want to be like a race director one day because of what you experienced there? Um. I wouldn't say I want I want to be a race director because of that. Um, I do want to be. So this is kind of, we've told a few people about it, but me and Ben Light, who I'm sure we'll talk a little bit in this podcast about, but he and I and one other friend are starting a um, racing and adventure company. <laughs> we, have a, we have a 100 mile route designed, a 60K route and a 200 mile route designed. We're just working with Forest Service to get those races approved. So it's definitely in the future, but I wouldn't say that that happened because of Ultra. Um, that would probably be more so just from all the fun that I've had at the 200 mile races, becoming friends with Candace Burt. Um, yeah. May maybe Ultra played a little bit into it because I had had the, I had had the opportunity to meet a lot of cool RDs like, Chris Thornley at Western States, 
Del Garland and Oliver Fisher at Hard Rock. Um, so I guess that probably has played a little bit into it um, now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more. Um, I definitely do think, though, that being an athlete manager has opened my eyes in a lot of ways to just, you know, being on the other side now with Solomon, it kind of has opened my eyes. Like, I know what my athlete manager is dealing with on her end because I've had to deal with it personally. So, like, I do my absolute best to not bombard her with questions through email, text, and all that kind of stuff because I know how stressful that job could be. So that has kind of shaped myself into trying not to be a little bit of a diva, if that makes sense. No, it's super interesting. And, and just for context, actually, we, so the la the, mo the two most recent episodes of this podcast, we spoke with Steph Gardner at Solomon, who I know you know, and we spoke with Robert Merke at Adidas Terex. And we're, and we're doing a whole series on this. So we'll, we'll talk with Mike McManus at Hoka and um, Kilgore at On, and just because I think this is a super fascinating part of our sport. And, and you were in it. You were literally in that seat uh, a couple of years back. So, um, yeah, what was it like being an athlete manager? And what are some takeaways that you have about like the athlete sponsor relationship, for example, that um, maybe folks that listen to this podcast, they want to be in your position one day, either as an athlete or as a manager uh, could learn from? Yeah, that's, that's kind of a hard question to answer just because there's so many takeaways that I got from that position. There's so many variables to factor in, um, you know, from the company side of things, like there's so many things to factor in when you're making the decision on who you want to be on your athlete team. Um, I mean, when I was the athlete manager, I, I received so many inquiries from people. Um, I don't know if they got my email from customer service or like they'd reach out to me through social, but they're just like share all these cool things that they're doing and they want to be an athlete for ultra because they were already wearing the shoes. And I mean, like I completely understood because if you're wearing some shoes, if you're doing some awesome things then why not reach out and try to be on that team and get some good deals and be able to represent a brand that you believe in and support in. But <clears throat> especially for ultra, like at the time we were still a fairly new company. Um, so like our parent company, gave us our budgets, which we had to operate within. And so like, even if I wanted to just give shoes and money to all these cool people who are doing all these amazing things, when it comes to the budget and growing as a business, that's obviously not sustainable. And so I'd say that was kind of the hardest thing was turning people away who obviously were doing great things, but it just didn't work with the budget. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I would say that was definitely the hardest thing of that position. Um, but in terms of the actual position overall, it was totally fun because, you know, I met Jason Schlarb at Hard Rock in 2016 when he and Killian tied together. Um, that was kind of my first month in that position. So being able to meet Jason Schlarb in person was pretty cool. Meeting Jeff Browning, Zach Bitter, Amelia Boone, like... It definitely was kind of a dream to be able to meet all these athletes and hang out with all these athletes and kind of feel a part of the team, um, if that makes sense. But it, yeah, it was a cool position to be a part of. I have two questions. And this first one, if you want, I can edit it out because it might not be fair, but I feel like I can ask it because you're out of the position now. Do you think that the, the way that the current relationship exists between the athlete and the sponsor, do you think that athletes have all of the information that they need to make an informed decision when um, picking a sponsor and negotiating contracts? Because as an observer, and I'm not, I'm not a sponsored athlete, but as an observer and a fan of the sport, I find it incredibly difficult to figure out like how much athletes make and if I was in their position, um, what I should be asking for and stuff like that. So I'm curious your thoughts there. I don't, at least in my position and being with Ultra, I don't think the athletes had a full understanding of it um, just because, and again, this might be different because it was Ultra and we were like, <clears throat> when I joined Ultra, we celebrated, I think it was our five year anniversary and that was my first year with them. So, and that, that was only, that was like six or seven years ago. So they're still a fairly young company. If you look at the whole grand scheme of all the oh, other yeah. brands out there. So just being a young company, like, I don't think the athletes understood 
like the budget that we had to work with. And I don't want to sound like a broken record and use the word budget over and over again, but <laughs> that was really the deciding factor in a lot of things. We had a budget budget to operate with and we had 20 amazing athletes that we wanted on our team. And we just really had to strategically give each of them what they're worth, but while also operating within our budget. And a lot of times the athletes probably didn't feel valued because of that. Um, and I totally get that, but when you're going to represent a young company, you got to be patient and you got to be willing to, to grow with them. If you truly do believe in that product and love that product and just wait for the company to hit that next level where they can start giving you a little bit more money and support. Well, maybe speaking generally about the entire industry, and I appreciate that answer by the way. Um, but maybe speaking more generally about the industry and let's include like more established, bigger companies in the mix. Do you think that um, it's an exception to the rule or a trend that athletes are asking for and getting less than they would otherwise be getting if they went to the table with like strong negotiating skills and knowing the resources that the people on the other side had? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm not going to give names, but like there is, there's a couple athletes who were great at negotiating and they knew what they were worth. Um, so they negotiated hard for what they wanted. And these two or three that did negotiate hard ended up getting it. Um, I don't know if I should be saying that or not, but. No, no, know. it's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, like the athletes definitely who had negotiating skills and pushed for something either got extremely close to what they were asking for, or they ended up getting what they were asking for. So, and it's hard with this sport too. Be, I mean, it's changing with like all of the broadcasting that we're doing, like with Coca Dona 250, Western States, even Badwater did it a little bit this year. Like we're definitely making the sport more known. And I'm sure with that, there's going to be more opportunity for um, brands to spend more money because they're going to end up making more money. But um, yeah, it's just a hard, so what I was getting at with that, it's just hard for athletes to figure out what they should ask for because it's still a sport that's not bringing in as much money as like the NBA or the NFL or something like that. If you could give any advice to, uh, athletes that are just coming up in the sport about how to approach this process, is there anything you can pull from your own personal experience that has seemed to work that you'd want to share with them? Just looking at it as investing into something that you believe in, um, whether that's buying the product over and over and over and just spending your hard earned dollars on the products that you believe in and sharing like I, social media is such a hard thing because if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, I'd probably get rid of it just because of all the drama that happens on social media. But the reality is like you could be winning races, every single race that you're doing, but if you don't have some kind of a following, there's a good chance the brands won't give you what you're worth athletically wise. Um, so it's, it's kind of a crappy balance because social media does play a large part into those decisions, but you know, I would just recommend continuing to invest in the product, continuing to wear it at your races and your training, sharing it on your social media, and just being patient for a couple of years and then reaching out to those those companies and you know, at a minimum <clears throat> at a minimum trying to get on like the ambassadorship level where you might get one or two pairs of shoes a year. Not necessarily any financial compensation, but just you know just like if you were at a company trying to work up the corporate ladder. Just try to get in on that ambassador level and just work up to what you actually want to be at and just be patient with the process. I was just thinking about this actually before our interview that in this day of age, it seems like brands expect athletes to work two jobs to focus <laughs> on performance at some of the biggest races and also to be hyper present on Instagram and, and just banging out all that social media. And I'm wondering, do you think that there should be a split there or should athletes just be expected to, uh, to wear both those hats? Where do you stand on that? I mean, personally, I really believe in separating social media influencers with performance. Like 
and Solomon kind of does this. Like, I don't know if Steph talked to you about this when she came on, but Solomon has like four or five different levels within the athletes. Like there's elites, pros, um, the Solomon squad, which I believe is the ambassadors. And then they also have a category of like influencers, like, you know, like Jamel Curry, he has like Air Viper, he does his media stuff, his videos, his podcasts. And so like, I think Solomon has a good balance with that because they have the performers, they have the performers and the influencers, and then just split out pretty evenly across the board. Yeah, she called it the inspiration team. And it's, I think Ricky yeah. Gates is on there too, and, and Rich Roll and a couple other cool people. Yeah. Um, well, cool, man. I, I, you know, I appreciate you shedding light on this area of the sport because I think it's a little bit under talked about and you have primary experience. So I, I appreciate it. Um, I do want to talk. So, yeah, I, I think I've just always associated you with Ultra just as a fan of the sport over years because you got in so early with them, but you made this move to Solomon, uh, which is super cool. And I'm curious, can you talk about what prompted that move and, and what your motivations were changing brands? Yeah, it's it's kind of a long story. Um, one that I don't want to go into too in depth. Um, but what I can say is that in 20... 18 or so, um, Ultra's parrot company at the time was called Icon Health and Fitness. They make um, one of the most popular brands that they have is Nordic Track and iFit. And so we were a part of <clears throat> that umbrella. And in 2018, Icon sold Ultra to VF Corp, who they <clears throat> they own North Face, Smart Rule, Vans, um, Dickies at the time. Like they had like 30 big brands under their umbrella. So it was quite a big um move or it, it was just a big event for all of us that worked for ultra because we were the small utah based company getting sold to a rather large organization and part of that sellout <clears throat> um, involved a move from northern utah to denver colorado and um, i got a position offered with me with the new company and like, you know, there was like a moving package and they flew us out there a few times to go house hunting and stuff. And I eventually made the decision, me and my wife, to move to Denver and kind of take a chance on it, which was really hard because both of our families are here in northern Utah. So and our friends. So we were just leaving friends and family and a place that I've spent my whole life to, to go to Denver and take a chance with this new position. And so we got over there in it was September of 2019 and within a few weeks we learned that this was not for me and my wife um, <clears throat> on a personal level just like we lived an hour from the mountains and where I'm at right now like <clears throat> there's a trailhead 20 seconds from my doorstep and so you know moving from that to or sorry moving from this to that was just really hard for me and then just my wife not having like the support of her friends and family, like the position that I had, I traveled a lot being the event manager. Like I was going to all the races. I went to the New York marathon, Chicago marathon, Boston marathon, and then all the trail races. So I was traveling a lot. And when I was doing that in Utah, my wife had family and friends to help her with the kids to go visit and just kind of keep staying while I was traveling so much. And she lost all that. So between all those things, we just decided it wasn't for us anymore. Um, so I ended up quitting Ultra to move back to Utah. Um, the plan was that we were going to continue an athlete sponsor relationship between me and them. But I'll just say through a few disagreements, that didn't end up happening. Um, but while I was going through all of that, my wife's cousin worked for Sunto, who was a part of the Amher Sports Umbrella, who owned Solomon. And so when she heard that I quit Ultra, she asked if she could connect me with Solomon. Um, and it was Steph that she connected me with. And Steph sent me a couple of shoes to try out. And through that process, I just learned that um, <clears throat> a big reason people would go to Ultra is for like wide feet because of their foot-shaped toe box. And through the process of trying Solomon's out, I realized that my feet were not as wide as I thought they were. And I actually liked the the kind of the taper at the end of a shoe just because I have a long middle toe. 
And I never realized how much I was banging my toes up in ultras just because it was a little bit closer to my long middle toe. And just throughout that process, I just learned that Solomon fit the width of my feet a little bit better. And durability wise, like you can't even compare Solomon to ultra. Like Solomon lasts hundreds of miles compared to the three to 400 miles you can get out of a pair of ultras if you're lucky. <laughs> I got to give a shout out to ultra though, because they make my favorite shoe of all time, which has since been discontinued. That's the ultra duo. I think that oh. a greater a greater trail shoe has never been made. That, and that's a road shoe too. <laughs> I know. I, I, I ran Western States in the duo. That was an awesome trip. It was a road shoe, but it was an awesome shoe for the trails too. <laughs> um, well, cool. Are you as integrated with Solomon as you were with Ultra? Like from a career standpoint, are you just a pro athlete for them, or do you also work in a corporate role as well? No, no corporate role. So. What does the rest of your day-to-day -day look like? Well, it is um, 3.30 here. So when I'm done here, so so my job, um, you know, I run and then I'm also a coach. Right now I'm coaching 58 people. So I have a pretty big list of people that I'm coaching. And so my days usually consist of emails, phone calls, building training plans, running, and then spending time with my family. And where it's almost the end of the the work day today, I try to reserve four to nine for my family every day. So when we're done here, I'm going to go play with my kids and make dinner and just kind of do dad stuff. Can you talk about the process of going at this like full time, uh, from like a self-employment standpoint, because yeah, like if I look at your LinkedIn, not to reference LinkedIn again, but you, uh, yeah, you worked the corporate life and, and now you're, you're going at it as like an entrepreneur in a sense. So, uh, what does that feel like? And, what gives you confidence that this, this whole thing can work? So it's a mixed feeling for sure. Um, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I miss part, like part of me misses the corporate side of things. It was fun being on the back end, being involved with shoe design, customer service, like contributing to the sport on a corporate level. Like I loved that. And when I started running for Solomon in 2020, there was a couple of times I had emailed Steph and, ask her to keep me posted on if there is any positions opening up within Solomon. So there is part of me that misses that. And especially the, the security of it, because being a coach, like it's probably daily that I worry about the future of what I'm doing professionally, especially with just how the economy is like when you start dealing with inflation and, um, mm gas prices going up and layoffs, like there's tons of layoffs happening, at least from what I've heard. Like one of the first things that people will look into is what they can do to like save themselves financially. And if I was an athlete that had a coach and I lost my job, one of the first things that would set like that I would cut would be my coach just because that's money that I can save. And so part of me worries about that, but you know, I started coaching in 2019 when I moved to Denver just as like a side gig because the cost of living in Colorado was much higher than it is here in Utah. And so when I started out, I had about five to six people that I was coaching just to help pay like for groceries and stuff. But, you know, <clears throat> as things progressed, like I, that, that following year, I got the Colorado Trail FKT. Um, when I started coaching, it was in the middle of the Triple Crown of 200s. Um, and then my zero calorie 100 and then just a bunch of other stuff happened in these past two years. And without me really trying much on my end, like that coaching pool grew from five people to thirties and forties. And so earlier this year, I just kind of got to a point where I was, I felt like I was working two full-time jobs because I did have a full-time job. I was the executive director at a nonprofit and then, so I was doing that and then I was trying to coach 40 people. It just felt very overwhelming. And so I got to the point where I decided that I either need to scale back as a coach or quit my full-time job and just take a chance and go all in on coaching. Mm. So I decided to take a chance on coaching and I went full-time in April. And since then it's grown, you know, to what it is today, 58 people. And so far it's just working out and, you know, I love what I do for multiple different reasons. <laughs> Well, I got to say, and I know you mentioned the economy these days and all the uncertainties associated with that, but 
and maybe this is actually a vote in favor of social media. I feel like if you've spent years growing a following and you've ultimately developed a pretty big audience, that can actually end up being a pretty solid safety net for things that you want to do in the sport from a career standpoint. Like um, it might not be in your case, but I, I've talked with other athletes who have built pretty large stables of rosters just based off of um, the fans that they've created on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. And I think that that's a super cool way to get things off the ground, but also, um, yeah, if the economy ever turns, you have people that have been fans of yours and they've admired you for a while and they want to work with you kind of ready whenever you're ready to work with them. Yeah, I, I hope that's right. <laughs> and I mean, the economy has been kind of crappy for a few months now and like, you know, there's been one or two people that's, that's left coaching because of finances and, you know, in the broad scheme of things, one to two people isn't a lot when you're trying to make a living. But so, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that, that it's just a worry of mine and it's not going to be an actual thing that I have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Well, switching gears a little bit, um, I'm based just to the south of you in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I know a little bit about the Logan area. Like when I think of Logan, I think of, like you said, Cache Valley, Bear 100, um, I know at various points in time, athletes like Jeff Browning have lived up there, Amanda Basham, yourself, but for anybody that has not been to the area and they're unfamiliar, can you paint a picture of why you enjoy it as a place to live and train and yeah, to go all in on running? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if I was to paint a picture in somebody's head, I'd say that Cash Valley looks a lot like Boulder. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but when I lived in Colorado for two months, um, whenever I do my weekend trail runs, I'd go to Boulder or Golden. And when you're driving to Boulder, there's this point where you like kind of drop down a little bit on like a hill that's a couple hundred feet. And once you drop down, you start driving up towards Boulder. And then it's just, you know, you got the whole range right there surrounding Boulder. And so if you factor in that little hill that you go down, it's, it's a little bit of a valley. Um, factoring like both of the, both sides in and then just the size of boulder the trees the green the way the mountains look like i feel like cash valley looks a lot like boulder um just picture like a valley and you're just surrounded by mountains and the only way to get out is through multiple different canyons so mountain wise like it's a great place to live um and the cool thing about our trails is they all connect somehow um where I live right now, like I said, I can walk out my front door and hit a trailhead in about 20 seconds. And that trail, if I follow it long enough, connects to the Bear 100 course. And I could, you know, run the Bear 100 course. I could do different variations of the course. I could do big loops to get back to my house. Like, just the trail access here is quite incredible. And it's pretty steep, too. Like, today I just did a 10-mile run that had 2,000 feet of gain. And that was just right out my front door. Um, <clears throat> I've done 27 mile loops that have about six to 7,000 feet of climbing. And again, that's all out my front door. So trail access is incredible. All the trails connect. Um, you get a ton of good vert. And then the best part is, is our trails are not busy. <laughs> um, we have like two or three iconic trails that everybody goes out on hikes. But aside from those two or three trails, like, you know, I could go run for 50 miles in my mountains and see two people if I'm lucky. So it's it's just pretty cool and unique to live here. What elevation are you at? And then how far can you get up to, like, from your door? My house is right at 5,000 feet. And um, I, if I wanted to, I could, in about 15 miles from my house, I could hit the highest peak in Cache Valley, which is just shy of 10,000 feet. So... In terms of, like, altitude, Logan's not the best. Like, we don't have anything above 10,000 feet, but there's a lot of steep trails and a lot of trails, which, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Like, I'm going to just be happy with what I have to work with, which is quite incredible. <laughs> and do you feel like you have most of the resources you need to be successful for the events that you train for? Like, I mean, I know you just did Bad Water, you've done Cocodona. You've done most of the 200 mile circuit in the U S hot races. I don't think I have the resources I need. Um, 
especially like a race like Cocodona, which takes place in May, like, you know, we were getting snow in April still here in Cache Valley, where you had a pretty wet spring, like, you know, it was, it's really hard to heat train for races up here in Logan. Um, altitude wise, I would say it's about 50, 50, cause getting up to 99, 50 or whatever our tallest peak is like, that's still pretty high up. But it would be nice to have access to peaks that are in the 10s, 11s, and 12s. But, you know, aside from those two things, I I definitely think I have everything I need to train for everything that I want to do. Right on. Well, I think it's cool, man. Like, Boulder gets a lot of love. Flagstaff gets a lot of love. Um, Seattle. But, you know, I think places like Logan, I'll even say Salt Lake City, Utah, I think that they fly tremendously under the radar. So um, it's cool to see an athlete like yourself getting it done there. Thank you. And just real quick, speaking of that, when I moved back to Logan, um, I think a few people who followed me at the time missed that I moved back. And so like I was putting up stories of trail runs that I was doing and there was lots of times people would reply to my stories and be like, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. What trail in Colorado is this? And I'm just <laughs> like, oh, it's not Colorado. It's Northern Utah actually. So the trails are incredible. And I definitely agree with you that it flies under the radar. And, you know, since we're on the topic, I don't know why Denver gets this reputation as a mountain town because it's not anywhere close to a mountain town. No, it's like 45 minutes away from the mountains. <laughs> that, was, that, Anyways. Was, that, that was the real ironic thing about Ultra moving to Denver. Like when VF, when the high ups came here and talked to us about moving us to Denver, like they just kept saying, like, we are a mountain company and we want to reflect that. So we're going to Denver. And in my head, I was just like, especially when I moved to Denver, I was like, this is so ironic. Like we were more of a mountain company in Cache Valley than we are here in Denver. But, but yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> well, before we get into your athletic career, and as you mentioned earlier, um, this Arizona trail project that you have upcoming with Ben Light, which I think is super innovative. I do want to talk about your nutritional philosophy. And I don't want to talk about the pros and the cons of it because I'm definitely not a dietitian and I'm not well-versed in that area. And honestly, you could be a vegan, you could be paleo, you could be high carb, you could be low carb, and it's not that interesting to me. But I think it's interesting that you're very public about it. And I'm curious, um, given that you've had a lot of success with your strategy for eating, um, yeah, just w what makes you want to, uh, to just be like, publicly sharing uh, your journey? Yeah, um, I have the attitude where if you tell me something is not possible, I'm going to go out to try to prove to you that it is. Um, and so when I started the low carb approach, it wasn't for that purpose. Um, I was having stomach issues and energy issues. And I met Jeff Browning, who was doing low carb at the time. And he told me why he does it and everything that he said in terms of reasoning for why he does it in my head was an answer to every issue that I was dealing with. And mm. so I, I tried it out and saw success with it and it fixed a lot of my issues. And so I just started doing it. I didn't talk about it a lot. Um, through that process though, you know, I, I found myself doing a lot of fasted training just because I felt better. And so I started questioning in my head how far I could go in a fasted state just for my own purpose and knowledge. Like I was just really curious and <clears throat> that led me to running a hundred miles in 2020 without eating any calories. And I would say that event is kind of what put my name out there a little bit more. Um, I didn't expect it to blow up as much as it did. And through that process, I had a lot of angry dietitians and sports nutritionists message me saying how, terrible of a person I am for doing this thing and sharing the results of this thing, because in their head, that was going to encourage other people to do it. And I can see what they were saying, but I felt like the way they were attacking me for it was just a little bit overboard. Um, mm -hmm. And so through that process of people telling me and just seeing all the discussions about it and all the different groups on Facebook and seeing all the people saying how stupid it is and how it's just impossible and unhealthy and all that kind of stuff, that's what kind of pushed me into talking about it more because, you know, after that experience, I not only had angry dietitians reaching out to me, but I had dozens and dozens and dozens of runners reaching out to me saying, Hey, 
thank you for doing this. I'm in a similar position where running and eating just hurts my stomach and I've never felt better running in a fasted state. And so <clears throat> the reason I talk about it is because I want all these people to know that there's no one size fits all diet for everybody. And it's not just me, but there's tons of people that are in similar positions that feel good about it. And, mm. you know, if like, it, it shouldn't be an issue for us to talk about it because it works for us. And I've never, if you can find a post on my social media or find an article where I've talked about this and please let me know and shut me up. But I've never promoted this as a lifestyle that's meant for everybody. I've always just said it works for some of us. And we're going to keep doing it while it works while it works for us. So please just stop telling us that we're stupid and crazy. Just like let us do our thing and leave us alone. <laughs> well, I think in general, even without this particular facet of um, social media, just in general, it's tough to be public on social media. And I'm curious, for all the years and months you've been active in this arena, are you at peace and happy with the way you've promoted this area of your life? or um, have have the costs outweighed the benefits in terms of like all like the angry uh, feedback you've gotten and stuff like that. I'm not oh, sure yeah. if I'm phrasing that correctly, but I'm, I'm just curious, like, like, are you happy that you've uh, contributed what you've contributed on social media? Or would you, looking back, wish you'd just like not said anything at all and just like done it on your own time? No, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy about it. Um... I feel like there's a lot of people who have gone from being miserable with their training and races to running happy and healthy again, because this was something that helped them. Um, I will say though, that because my personality is one that if you tell me this is unhealthy and wrong, I'm going to do it even harder. Kind of. I don't know if you watch the office or not. Oh yeah. I relate myself a lot to Michael Scott and the episode where um, Pam finds out that he's dating her mom and he just looks at her and goes, I'm going to date her even harder. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's kind of like me. <laughs> so like, if you tell me it's wrong, I'm going to do it even harder, especially if I'm feeling benefits from it. But because of that, I feel like I have gone a little bit to the extreme side of things. And I talk to like the people I coach about this a lot and people that reach out to me on Instagram, I let them know these kind of things. I'm not trying to hide it, but I've gone so far to the extreme that you know, if you follow me, you know that I had stomach issues at Badwater and Cocodona this year. And so I had a realization on the drive home from Badwater that I went way too far to the extreme and I've been fasting way too much. And so now when I get to these races and I try to take in calories and carbs like every hour, my stomach just freaks out and doesn't know how to digest it anymore. And that's why I'm getting these stomach issues. At least that's what I'm hypothesizing. So I am starting to just strategically pick certain days when I fast like three days a week versus the seven days a week that I used to be doing and just, you know, using fasting as a way for me to enjoy the things I enjoy about fasting, but like on recovery days and then mm -hmm. all the other days practicing eating again so that my stomach doesn't freak out when I actually do take in calories at races. So I would say that is the one thing that I do regret a little bit as I just, I went a little bit too hard in that direction, but you know, now I'm correcting it and hopefully it will, I'll work out. Well, man, I appreciate all that. And for anybody in the audience that is frustrated that we didn't go into the X's and O's of diets, I apologize. I'm not the person for that conversation, but I, I'm utterly fascinated by anybody in any realm that uh, is just interested in being super public about uh, whether it's training philosophy or nutritional philosophy or anything. So super cool. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, though, is just your level of investment in the 200-mile racing scene. And I love to put things in historical context. And when I think about you and uh, the investment you've made there, I'm reminded a lot of like what Carl Meltzer did about 20 years ago when he said, I'm just going to make the 100-mile distance my thing. And at the time, I mean, yeah, it might have been a staple in the community, but he just made it his niche and he invested in it. And then 20 years later, he's got like 40, hundred mile wins. So, um, a, I'm curious what made you want to make two hundreds your thing. And then B, do you think in similar lines, like this is just going to be my niche and I'm going to own it for my career? 
Yeah, so your first question, um, I wouldn't say that I went into it with the intent for it to become my thing. Um, so the first time that I ever decided I wanted to run 200 miles was back in 2014. Um, I was doing my first 100, which was the Bear 100. And mm. um, I'm sure, have you heard of Ty Draney? Yeah. Yeah, okay. When I did, when I did the Bear 100 in 2014, I learned about this guy named Ty Draney who started at the end of the Bear 100, he ran it backwards, and then he camped out at the start line for like five hours, and then he ran the race. And he actually finished like an hour after me, which was kind of embarrassing at the time. <laughs> but um, after that race, like I, I saw him get his award and everybody congratulated and talked about it. And I was just like, wow, that's so cool that he ran 200 miles. I'd love to try that one day. And so that was kind of the thing that got in my head at the time, like, Spiced, spiced my interest into it. Um, I didn't know there were actual races at the time, though. I thought 100 miles was the top. And then in 2016, um, you might know him since you live in Salt Lake. Do you know DJ Lorchester? Yeah. Yeah. So he and I met at the Zion 100 in like 2015. And we ran a lot of that race together and became pretty good friends. And I remember seeing him in 2016 going after... At the time, it was called the Double Crown of 200s because there was no Moab 200 at the time. And seeing him do that, that's when I first learned that 200-mile races existed. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. And so after he finished the Double Crown, I reached out to him and asked for him just to tell me all the deets of these 200-mile races and what was so cool about it and what was so hard about it. And after talking to him, I was like, this is kind of cool. I'm going to sign up for Bigfoot 200 next year. And then as I thought about it more, I knew me and DJ were similar runners, and I saw that he won the double crown of 200s. So I was like, oh, cool. I like I hadn't, I hadn't won anything at this time, so I was like, I kind of want to win something, so maybe I'll try the double crown and see if I can beat his time. So I signed up for Bigfoot. Um, just as I was getting ready to sign up for Tahoe, Candace announced the Moab 240. And so I decided not to do the double crown because I didn't want to do three of them. Um, and at the time I was still like, I was a newlywed, just had our firstborn child. So we didn't have a lot of money. So I just decided to go with the Bigfoot 200. Did it, had a terrible experience. Um, Jeff Browning was coaching me at the time. We had a conversation after and he told me all the things that he think I did wrong. And so then my, my brain peaked a little and I was like, well, maybe if I do this, maybe if I do a 200 and listen to Jeff, Maybe I'll have a better experience. So, you know, a week after Bigfoot, I ended up signing up for Tahoe and Moab and just went for the Triple Crown that year. Um, all, all three races went pretty terribly, but I did get the overall combined time of the Triple Crown or the best overall combined time. And then I took a two-year break from the 200 scene, and then I signed up for all three again just to, like, see if I could beat my time. And then that was the year that I ended up winning all three of the races. Um, and so when I finished Moab 240 and won Moab 240, I decided like, you know, maybe I'm actually pretty good at this distance. And so that's kind of what catapulted me into signing up for more to see if it was just a fluke or to see if I actually could win some more. And um, just found out that it's something that I can do and succeed at, which you know, everybody wants to try to succeed at something. So um, that's one reason I started to stick with it. But then two, I just like the style of these races. Like, you know, all of us do ultra races for different reasons, but it's like, you know, the longer the distance you do, the more you get to see and the more you get to experience. So like, you know, everything you experience in a 100 mile race, just kind of quadruples like it doesn't double for a 200 you just get so many more experiences of the 200 and i just love those experiences and there, you know there's a special 200 mile community that you get to be a part of too like you see a lot of the same racers at these things so it's just just something that feels like home to me so i'm, I'm going to keep doing it i've had a couple people on this podcast now that are i'd say at a similar experience level to you in the 200 scene they all tell me that training for these things and expectations on race day are still somewhat of a black box. So I'll ask you, is there anything that you've picked up over the last five to six years that give you any sense of comfort or predictability on race day that like 
all of the work that you put in is going to be realized and there's going to be like payoffs or is it still to you also like a black box? Yeah, it's, I would say that I reached a point where it wasn't a black box, but just with how Coca Dona went this year, I'm starting to kind of go back to thinking it is. Um, but if I get this nutrition thing figured out again, then maybe I'll change my mind. I don't know. I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but I'm kind of indifferent on how I feel about that right now. Well, like if you were, if you just met somebody in passing and you mentioned that you did 200 milers and they're like, shit, I want to do the same thing. Um, like what, what would be like the top two or three points of wisdom that you would give them, uh, as they approach their training? Um, it's a good question. Um, I would say one of the biggest things is to pr practice power hiking. Um, because when you hit mile 150 at a 200 mile race, you know, which people did not practice power hiking. Um, and it's crazy how much time you can save going from a power hike or sorry, going from like that death slog that you see people do at races where they're just walking like one mile an hour. It seems like there's quite a bit of difference, quite a bit of time you can make up if you go from that to having a good power hike game. So I do a lot of practice with power hiking. Like in my training, I have run specific, like uphill running specific workouts. I have workouts where I shift between running and power hiking to work on my transitions. And then I have workouts where I'm just dedicating to power hiking and just working on those muscles. So working on power hiking is a big one. Um, I feel like I'm kind of, I might be alone in this arena. Maybe I'm not, but one big thing that I like the people that I coach who are training for 200s, something that I talk to them about, especially before their first 200 is sleep deprivation training. That's the real kicker for people who end up not doing well at a 200 as well as they want to do at least. Um, usually it's because of not being used to the sleep deprivation and figuring that out. And so I do think it is important and you only have to do it two to four times. Like you don't have to do it every weekend, but there are a couple of times that I'll schedule somebody's weekend run where they're like going to do a two hour run on a Friday night, starting at like 10 PM. So they're starting in the dark, they're running typically past their bedtime Then they're going to get home and go to bed and then wake up again around 5 AM the next day and go for like a three or four hour run. Oh, wow. So that just gets them used to running in the dark, um, going to bed, and then waking up not much longer after they go to bed and then going for another long run. Um, just because if you don't have a somewhat idea of how tough it is, like it, if your first experience doing that is in the middle of a 200-mile race where you go to bed for 45 minutes, you wake up and you have to go run another 105 miles. Like it's, it's kind of a mental butt kick, <laughs> like it, it's hard. And so just doing that a couple of times kind of gets you used to that. And it's not as strange or unfamiliar when the actual race comes. Um, mm -hmm. so sleep deprivation, getting used to that. And then what was the other thing I was going to say? Power hike, sleep deprivation. And I don't remember the other one. <laughs> well, I think the sleep, I, you know, the sleep deprivation one is new to me, and I didn't realize that there was benefits to be gained there. I guess I never considered the fact that you could get adaptations in training. Um, yeah, like off that limited amount of sleep and like. Well, I think adaptation oh, is a little bit of a stronger word than what I'm trying to relay because I don't think you're going to get adapted to it, but it's just like, like mileage wise, I would say my training for a 200 does not vary from my training for a 100. Like the difference when you get to a 200 mile race is it's all mental, like after that hundred mile mark. Um, to be honest with you, I recover faster after 200s than I do 100s because there's more strategic hiking than a 100. And so physically, mm. if you can do a 100, you can physically do a 200. But once you hit mile 100 and you're feeling as sore as you would at the end of a 100-mile race, 
mentally it's a slap in the face when you realize you still have halfway to go. And so I wouldn't say sleep deprivation and your training helps you adapt. It just gets you one step closer mentally to where you need to be to be able to finish that kind of a race, if that makes sense. Mm. Well, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here. I just have two more questions for you. Uh, one last one on the 200 mile scene. You've now been in this for five or six years. Do you notice the fields getting more and more competitive with each year? Like, are you noticing growth in that part of the scene or, um, is it the same usual suspects that you're lining up against and competing with? No, it's, it's growing for sure. Like Cocodona had Joe string bean McConaughey show up. Um, he crushed it. I know like Jeff Browning, he's going to do Moab 240 this year. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So I definitely think more and more people are starting to do it and it's starting to get more competitive. What do you have lined up next? Arizona trucks. Yeah. And you know, we got to talk about that. I think that this is one of the coolest concepts in our sport that, uh, I have come across in recent years because it, it reminds me of like the ultra running equivalent of some sort of sports pay-per-view, like a boxing match <laughs> that you would see on HBO. So, uh, maybe just start from the beginning, like tell the audience how this idea came about, what's involved, what the competition looks like, everything. Yeah. So, um, I will say Ben light. Um, he, the thing that he's known for, for the people that follow him is he does like these crazy adventures. Um, his most recent adventure, he called the Wasatch Tahoe project. Did you, did you read about that at all? I hadn't, I haven't heard of this. So then he, his first 200 is before me. He's been doing, doing the two hundreds for a while. Um, he's okay. actually the one that got me into two hundreds. And he, Tahoe 200 was kind of his baby. He was doing it year after year after year. And he'd always wanted to do the Wasatch 100, which followed on the same weekend. And so he got this concept and he actually told me about it in 2017 when we did the Triple Crown together. And I thought he was an idiot when he told me this idea. We were like smack in the middle of the Tahoe 200. I was tired, fatigued and hurting when he was talking about this cool project he wanted to do. And I just thought it was so dumb. <laughs> but he he thought of this idea where he would run the Wasatch 100, which starts at 5 a.m. Utah, which is 4 a.m. California time. Um, Tahoe 200 starts at 9 a.m. California time, which is 10 Utah time. So there's a five-hour buffer. And the Tahoe 200 has like a 105 or 110-hour cutoff time. And so Ben's idea was to run the Wasatch 100, which ends near Heber, Utah, and there's a small airport there. He hopped in the car, drove to the airport, got on a plane, flew to Truckee, California, drove to Homewood Ski Resort at Tahoe, and then he ran the Tahoe 200. And so he's known for doing these like crazy projects that not a lot of people think about. Okay. Uh, and so this was Ben's idea, um, what we're going to do this October. Um, but basically we're calling it the Arizona um, FKT Showdown or something like that. We, we've changed the name a few times, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to, so the Arizona trail, it's an 800 mile trail that spans the whole length of the state going from the border of Utah to the border of Mexico. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I said this, it's 800 miles. And what we're going to do is we're going to start on opposite ends and then race each other to the opposite side to try to snag the FKT. And the unique thing about the current FKT on the Arizona trail, <clears throat> um, you know, if I was to like the Colorado trail, for example, there's four different variations of the Colorado trail. And with those four different variations, there's four different FKTs. Um, Arizona trail, however, there's two different variations, just north to south or south to north. But even though there's two different variations, there's only one FKT. And so the unique thing is, is that you know, there's only going to be one FKT snagged, assuming one of us gets it. So we're, we're legit racing for an FKT. Um, and then just to make it like, this wasn't my idea. If it was my choice, we wouldn't do this because just logistically, it's been a nightmare for me to try to plan like crew. Like I was just having dinner with my dad last night who wants to come out and crew. And like, I was just like, I didn't know what to tell him if he should drive to the Utah border or if he should purchase plane tickets to Phoenix because the other aspect that we're doing is we're flipping a coin five days before 
to determine who's starting on what end. And so that's kind of a headache, but let's, let's just do it, I guess, and see, let's just make it a little bit more challenging, I guess. <laughs> and from a, from a spectator standpoint, do you have any plans in place for how this is going to be broadcast on social media and live trackers and stuff like that? Yeah, so if you're going for an FKT, you need to have some kind of tracker on you um, so it can be legit. So we are, I forget what they're called. It's a new tracking company based out of Europe, but um, it's similar to like a spot tracker or a track leaders where you can like see where somebody is on the trail. But the cool thing about this specific company is they can actually create a ghost. And in this scenario, the ghost would be streaming and it would show where he's at for his current FKT. And so you can see where we need to be in relation to his ghost as we're trying to track that, or sorry, trying to get the FKT. And so we will have that, which is kind of cool. We'll have that on a landing page on a website. Um, Jamil Curry, Aravipa, I know he's expressed interest on coming out there to do some filming. Um, at a minimum, um, Jeff Garmeyer, who used to have the FKT, I don't know if you've talked to him before, the legend. Um, he, I was just talking to him over the weekend. He was at this race in Montana that I just went to to crew. And he was saying that essentially the, cool. whole, the whole trail has cell coverage. And so at a minimum, we'll be able to do a lot of updates through social media. But we are, we do have a pitch deck created that we're trying to send to like corporations to try to get a little bit of help to help pay for like a full on, um, like a videographer to come out and to like make a good video out of it. Who are the types of brands that you think would be interested in that kind of stuff? Like I'm guessing Solomon and, and, and Ben's sponsors have to be in mind there, but are there any non-traditional plays that could be in the mix? Like, I don't know, like Costco, for example, or some just non-endemic sponsor to our sport? Yes, yes and no. Like I am like I am looking for corporations that are not traditional, but they still do have a connection to me in some way. So for example, um, I am trying to work with a company called Maloof, who's based out of here in Northern Utah. Maloof makes like, um, they make mattresses and bedding and stuff. And um, part of my story, I don't need to go into depth in this, but I broke my back 10 years ago. Um, and okay. one of the things that hurts my back the most is laying down. And so historically, like I wake up and toss and turn a lot throughout the night. I have to like always change my position to get comfortable. But this Maloof company, they make a, um, a bed that has like the adjustable base where you can raise your feet or raise your back. And so I purchased one of those five years ago, and that's been a game changer for my quality of sleep and my back pain. And so I am going to talk to them and just kind of be like, hey, like we're working on getting RV rentals for this thing. Um, my plan is to try to run, like to get the FKT is 64 miles a day, just averaged out. So it's 100K a day. And in my head, I'm like going to try to hit that 100K a day within 18 hours or so. And so that will give me five to six hours to sleep a night still. And so I am going to pitch to this company, like I'll take my mattress into this RV. And, you know, if you can give us X amount of money to help with this film thing, then there's going to be a lot of good shots of me just like passed out on your mattress. And I'll even talk about how much your mattress has helped my back and this like in my, in my training and in my growth and running. And so there, there are non-traditional companies that I'm planning on reaching out. I love that. Yeah. And then just connecting it back somehow. I think that that's brilliant. I am, yeah, needless to say, I am super excited to follow this. Of course, we'll link to it all in the show notes. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour here, man. I have super appreciated your time. We'll have to do a round two at some point. Um, but yeah, I think we covered a lot of great ground. Anything else that you want to leave the audience with before we go? Oh, I'm terrible <laughs> at these kind of questions. Um, yeah, usually what I end with when I do a podcast, like usually I get asked for like advice or something. And the biggest thing I usually just try to tell people is just consistency is king. Um, you know, I believe in the 80-20 rule. And that's where if you're like doing something 80% of the time, you have a 20% um, cushion to not do it if you need to. And, you know, I don't believe that running is something that should consume our lives. 
So, you know, it shouldn't get in the way of your family. It shouldn't get in the way of other duties that you have. So lean into that 80-20 rule and take days off if you need to um, for important things and to make sure that you have longevity in the sport. But when you do take those days off, um, just still try to be a little bit consistent. Um, You can take a day off and still go out and run for a mile or two. Um, and that's just building up the consistency of throwing on your shoes, getting out the door and doing something. So, you know, obviously volume and training is important for your goal races, but don't let it consume your life. And on those days that you don't let it consume your life, still just try to like be just like a little bit consistent, if that makes sense. Great message. Well, Mike, thanks again. Great to meet and, uh, best of luck in training. And we'll, uh, we'll check back in once the AZ journey commences yeah for sure i do think it'd be a good idea this just came to my head like since there is service throughout the trail like there might be opportunity to do a podcast at day eight and see how we're feeling kind of a thing but that you know what that's not we we should you know what we'll talk offline i think it'd be cool to find a way to check in with your crew and even do like a three to five minute like daily summary of the events that have gone on so that people can uh have as close to the action updates as possible. I think it's a brilliant idea. That'd be cool. Cool. Hey, we just decided something live on the podcast. This is sweet. (laughs) Yeah, awesome. (laughs)